attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, um, good morning. So we are starting our uh, webinar now. Um, so we'll start off with the uh, Singapore banking and finance sector. We'll talk about the outlook for Singapore exchange in the financial year 2018, which will begin uh, um, on the second, second half of the uh, 2017. And then we'll look at the Singapore banking sector third quarter earnings preview followed by uh, results from Capital Land Commercial Trust, Capital Land Mall Trust, and Capital DC REIT. Then we will have um, the macro strategy, uh, Philip Mundy uh, Recession Tracker, and finally um, a presentation of the company visits to First REIT and UG Healthcare Core. So for um, SGX, we have uh, raised the target price to $8.39, previous target price uh, $7.63, representing upside of 9.8% from last close um, of, uh, last close is in Friday's close of uh, $7.64. Um, we are expecting the strong uh, SDAV performance and DDAV uh, to continue in FY18, uh, as on the back of synchronous global recovery and um, some regional uh, volatility. So the, uh, there, we are also expecting stronger performance for the um, equity index, the China A50 equity index uh, futures and the currency futures of USD uh, CNH pairing and the Indian rupee and USD pairing. Uh, this is on the back of uh, some changes to the domestic regulation in uh, China and in India and some of the uh, macro volatility that we saw um, in the uh, North Korean um, missile uh, uh, threats and perhaps some of the political uncertainties that is um, hanging around uh, globally. So the, uh, the only downside uh, moving forward is that the new IPOs have not been able to keep pace with the number and size of companies that are uh, slated for delisting. Uh, all in, we, was, we are still ex uh, expecting higher SDAV of 1.16 billion for FY18, um, higher than our previous estimate of 1.08 billion. Next, uh, we look at some of the challenges to the SGX securities market. Um, the first problem would be, of course, the Hong Kong uh, exchange stock connect with Shanghai and Shenzhen. So as we can see here on the right-hand corner is that if you look at the evolution of the uh, um, uh, capital markets in Hong Kong, they're increasingly moving towards individual flows and some of these regulations, if, as it, as it um, improves, we're going to see uh, a lot more engagement with the wider audience in the mainland. And of course, the next thing is that there's the highest um, concentration of high net worth individuals in the Pearl River, Delta area, Shanghai, Hangzhou and Beijing uh, that will actually help um, um, improve the southbound uh, trades. Uh, as for now, there's an individual investors must have a balance of 500,000 RMB in their cash and securities account in order to trade the Hong Kong listed stocks. So uh, if th this um, regula uh, regulations um, if there's any, any changes to this that could improve uh, the, the individual uh, investors' access to Southbound, then of course uh, there will be more activity if, uh, on our core exchange. Next is that uh, if you look at our report, we have shown, uh, we have listed the, um, we have compared the IPO listing requirements um, between SGX, Hong Kong Exchange, and AXX. And SGX has a stricter profitability requirement and threshold. Um, in terms of the revenue and the market cap. Uh, and then there's also the cost to list on SGX. SGX requires a quarter quarterly reporting and issuance of annual sustainability reports. And um, this additional reporting also would add cost to the corporates and we discuss, uh, discourage the issuers from listing on SGX. And then uh, the one of the more commonly cited reasons for listing overseas would be the better valuation. However, this is um, is something which we cannot 
uh, put a finger to also because if we look at the startup scene, we, we have very highly valuable startups uh, founded from, from the initial stage all the way to the top with very strong funding. But when it comes to the public markets, um, they would say there's not enough, uh, there's not, uh, there, there's no uh, good valuation, which is quite idiosyncratic. Um, but uh, nonetheless, we still see that um, the uh, SGX is, is um, coming out with strategies to uh, boost up the IPO market. So that's the IMDA and the SGX partnership. And here we, we can see that the um, number of IPOs and the, and the proceeds that's being raised um, is still lackluster compared to its peers. Uh, year to date, um, IPO proceeds have exceeded uh, 2016 for SGX is because of the Netlink Trust IPO, which raised 2.3 billion. Um, here on the bottom left-hand corner, we can see that the SGX listed securities are on the decline as IPOs are slowing and the delistings are accelerating. Um, the next would be the impact on delisting of GLP. We think this would have a significant, uh, we, we have some uh, impact. Uh, that's because the uh, GLP's market cap is 15.5 billion and it's um, VWAP, uh, it's monthly average, v, uh, the, the GLP's VWAP turnover value um, between the uh, over the period from January 16, 2016 to August 2017 is about um, 851 million. That is about 3.6% of SGX's average monthly securities market turnover value of 23.6 billion. And this, um, the monthly VWAP value could go as high as 5% to 8%. So well, without the GLP, we think that uh, there, could, there will be less um, uh, turnover. Uh, bearing in mind also that the, even the Netlink Trust uh, IPO may not fully um, uh, compensate for that uh, for GLP's delisting uh, because uh, Netlink Trust market cap is only about 3.2 billion. Um, even though it's free float, it's uh, about twice of GLP. Okay, next. Um, but our outlook is predicated on um, also the uh, better performance coming out from the financial and property stocks. Uh, so um, we in, in in the next uh, as as I've mentioned, we are going to talk about the uh, uh, third quarter preview for the for the banks, and we are quite optimistic about them. And then also for the uh, on block momentum, if you all might have uh, would have followed the. Um, the on block uh, fee, uh, on block uh, momentum, you realize that the, the property stocks are coming back up again. So the financials make up about forty eight percent of the securities market turnover value, and uh, the continued uh, strong performance from there would help boost the SDAV value. So on the uh, next, we will move into the some of the major developments to the SGX derivatives business, and um, first we will look at. The iron ore. Uh, there were some issue. Uh, there were some concerns about the competition from CME, uh, but SGX continues to maintain their market share ninety five percent outside the China market, outside the onshore China market. And uh, but presently, the CME's uh, comp the competition for CME is is less of a threat because it is proven that the CME operates in the European time zone and do not see most of the trading in the Asian time zone. And bear in mind that. I know is actually an Asian centric product. So um, then next would be the Indian rupee and USD futures performance. So I've mentioned the regulate, regulate, uh, regulators in India have restricted the um, uh, foreign exposure to domestic deriv uh, derivative products through P notes. But now this exposure to P uh, the, the use of P notes is restricted to the purpose of hedging um, the equity sh uh, exposure. So um, what we saw is that in the in July August the um, global portfolio managers have cut the exposure to Indian equities and therefore with that low that lower exposure to Indian equities they will not be able to access the P notes as much. So in order to trade the volatility they have to assess assess it through, uh, offshore, uh, which is through um, the SGX. Then next would be the Korean. Peninsula uh, tensions, which had um, 
created more volatility, uh, especially uh, on the CNH, and therefore it benefited the USD CNH futures volume. And on top of that, the uh, Chinese central bank had relaxed the stock index futures trading rules earlier this year uh, by reducing the margin requirements and raising the daily limit. And we are seeing that uh, the China A50 uh, volume itself is, has bottomed up uh, at the beginning of this year and it's on a, on a growth trajectory. So um, the FX pairing and the, uh, China, um, the CNH FX and the China A50 uh, uh, equity index, there's a, there's a pairing for, for uh, market participants. So they can actually use this pairing and, and, and drive up volumes for SGX. Um, finally, the listing of the Asia-Pacific exchange as a third derivatives uh, exchange in Singapore, we do not see uh, it as a direct competition because they are um, opening up the, they are, they are using it to um, to launch the refined palm oil contracts with which SGX does not offer. However, the Apex is majority owned by um, Mr. Eugene Chu, who, who held a senior position in Thailand Commodities Exchange and Thailand Commodity exchange is the largest onshore um, exchange for iron ore so it would not be a surprise if in future he uh, he would decide to launch um, the iron ore uh, contracts to expand into the offshore market but uh, but being him being based in, in but apex being based in Singapore also means that they would adhere to stricter rules pertaining to risk-based exposure such as the margin requirements and the maintenance of special reserve funds and that would raise the bar to apex growth strategy important to note the Italian exchange margin requirement is about is minimum as five percent uh, in Singapore the margin requirement for iron ore is anywhere between 5, uh, 11 percent to 14 percent and here's to show that the um, Iron ore, thermal coal, steel, um, which, is, which is the primary products that SGX is driving, is actually 80% um, is produced in Asia and also 80% of it is, is consumed within Asia. So it's uh, very much an Asian-centric product. And um, here, here are the graphs to show the performance for the INR, USD, USD, CNH futures and the A50. So you can see that the A50 has already bottomed up at the beginning of the year. And the SGX has outperformed Hong Kong exchange for the USD CNH currency futures product um, here on the right hand side. Uh, we believe that is primarily because of the synergies between the China A50 futures and the USD CNH uh, currency futures uh, that is offered on the SGX platform. So SGX now controls 75% of the USD CNH futures market and we estimate Hong Kong exchange makes up the rest of the 25%. And uh, here is uh, the, the um, segment breakdown. Uh, we can see that 80% of uh, SGX derivatives business is um, equity, uh, equity index futures, and none of it is actually a domestic uh, Singapore domestic product. Um, so we, we can see that, and also try to appreciate that actually SGX has been very successful in growing the derivatives business, despite the fact that it, it, it does not carry any of its uh, any domestic um, products. And it has also the highest concentration of commodities and foreign exchange futures, which is at about uh, making up about um, uh, thirteen percent. And the next thing we also try to appreciate is that the um, SGX is able to provide a margin offset for um, FX equity, FX commodity uh, cross product um, uh, offsets, and this is something which is quite unique uh, to SGX. And next, uh, we will look at the, uh, just to give you a, a sense of comparison, we look at Hong Kong exchange and, and Australian stock exchange uh, deriv derivatives portfolio and you can see that actually uh, Hong Kong exchange is highly concentrated in its domestic equity index futures and also the stock options. So there's not much diversity in here. And the as for AXX, uh, derivatives business is 97% is made up of, the, of domestic products, which is uh, interest rate futures options and its own index uh, equity index futures um, even AXX uh, commodity products are domestic electricity futures and options and soft commodity futures and they are not uh, active products 
So in, in short, uh, there's very little competition coming out from these two exchanges to SGX's uh, derivatives business. Finally, we see that um, despite the, the non-domestic and highly diversified portfolio, SGX's deriv derivatives uh, monthly volume is comparable to Hong Kong Exchange and AXX. Um, but I'll just bring attention to the last four months, uh, Hong Kong Exchange derivatives business uh, is strong only because of the stock options business and we know that the Hong Kong Stock Exchange has been roaring so that has led to this uh, sharp upturn. And um, next we look at the um, qualitative uh, comparison and we see that uh, as, uh, uh, sorry, quantitative comparison. You see the SGX has the strongest ROE and ROE among its peers. Um, and also the uh, EPS growth uh, growth forecast is actually higher than Japan Exchange and AXX, but its forward price earnings is the lowest uh, and we believe that SGX is conservatively uh, valued compared to the peers. Um, if you look the year-to-date return of SGX is 9.7, that is that is actually um, falling behind of S uh, STI's year-to-date return of double digit. So in a way, SGX has, uh, has some room to catch up. Next, we look at the third quarter 17 earnings preview for the Singapore banking sector. Um, we are very optimistic of the banking sector uh, given that uh, we have previously um, alluded to, uh, at, to, to the positive uh, loans uh, volume and rate dynamics becoming more positive. So we upgraded uh, not, now we upgrade it uh, to new to accumulate from neutral. We maintain the loans growth at mid single digits uh, because we going to, going to see the second half of the loans growth compared to the to a high to a higher base in the second half of sixteen. And what I mean by higher base, the second half of sixteen is that uh, the markets have have, it, have showed some improvement uh, second half of sixteen. So we are comparing it year on year on a, from a higher base. So we expect the net interest income to increase by 6 to 11% across the three banks and the rising Singapore on block sales momentum is a strong tailwind for the banks. Um, secondly is that we also expect uh, much lower provisioning from the banks, uh, provision expense from the banks quarter to quarter, year on year because uh, we are seeing that the uh, MPLs is, is likely to stabilize as uh, the offshore oil and gas uh, this uh, uh, sector is showing signs of um, bottoming out. We um, we are expecting that interest margins to only improve, uh, increase, expand by one to three basis points. Uh, not exceptional because this will be a loans growth led kind of uh, um, increase in, in net interest income. So uh, the net uh, and we have also highlighted that uh, the competition among uh, amongst the banks for housing loans is also still quite high. So this is a volumes game rather than um, um, interest rates game. So we expect OCBC to report one-off gains of 100 million on the sale of the United Eng Engineers, the BCS and the BCSIS. And we um, increase the target price for the banks as we roll over to FY18 uh, valuations. So DBS, we are, we are giving it a higher target price of 25.70, previously 21.45. OCBC um, uh, target price 11.95 previously 10.81, and UOB target price 21.61 previously 20.18. So this is our estimates versus the consensus. Uh, so our loans growth estimate for DBS is higher than consensus because we believe that DBS is uh, a lot more aggressive in competing for loans. Um, so. Uh, Likewise, the, um, the net interest margins would be lower than the consensus also because of the, uh, the, the competition. The allow our allowances across the three banks are lower than the consensus because we have a more uh, we have optimistic view on the uh, on, uh, on the oil and gas sector. Um, optimistic in the sense that we believe it is bottoming out and they will show some uh, better, uh, show signs of recovery in the second half of uh, 2017. And therefore, with the lower uh, allowance uh, provision expense in the second half and uh, stronger net interest income growth, our uh, third quarter PADME um, uh, uh, forecast is a lot higher than, than the consensus. 
here, uh, uh, again, we show the uh, domestic loans growth, the system loans growth. So you can see that although the loans growth is uh, slowing down um, in the second half, uh, but that's because we are comparing it from higher base in, 2000, in the second half of 2016. Then we can see that the three-month cyborg and one-month cyborg have moved up. The one-month cyborg have moved up uh, a lot faster than the three-month, uh, 20, 20 basis points. And uh, let's put it in comparison to what's happening on the ground for the um, for the mortgage uh, rates, so you can see that the universal banks, as, uh, for example, a Citibank, HSBC, Standard Chartered Bank, have generally reduced their one-month cyber packed housing uh, loan packages. Uh, so th they are really so this to to further emphasize what's uh, the kind of competition that we are seeing on the Singapore uh, mortgage. You know that the cyber has uh, one-month cyber have moved up more sharply but yet they have um, targeted the one month cyborg packed housing packages and, and competed, competed uh, and compete at a more uh, intense manner. Okay, um, so if we have followed the earnings uh, reef in the second quarter of 2017, you notice that the OCBC and DBS's uh, Hong Kong net interest margins have been weak. Uh, that's because the one-month high ball has remained low despite the uh, Fed rate uh, hikes. And that has actually impacted the net interest margins in Hong Kong. But after that, um, we, we see in the second, uh, third quarter that uh, the one-month high ball has started to come up. And then, of course, in, in September, it moved up even higher. So we, we, with that, we are expecting a better uh, margin expansion in Hong Kong. Okay, finally, so why we feel that the offshore oil and gas would be, uh, is bottoming out, uh, is basically uh, here we can see that the Southeast Asia jackup, uh, jackups uh, utilization have improved since February, this earlier this year, although the, uh, the day rates have remained low, but at least the utilization is, is creeping up. Then here we have an article that Merce drilling reactivates is semi-submersible uh, semi um, for Southeast Asia job, and this is the fifth uh, semi semi sub that they have reactivated from warm stacking, and at least their their guide the their chief commercial officer has guided for uh, a, a more optimistic um, outlook. They say that there's um, a, a increase in demand for deep water rigs in Southeast Asian market, and then uh, finally we we look at uh, Capricor net uh, Cap Capricor's uh, net order book. So they have just just announced their um, third quarter results and we see that it is the first time that uh, the net order book has increased quarter on quarter. So all this put in, we, we feel that um, uh, the forward outlook is um, more optimistic and therefore the banks should uh, actually um, not see, uh, would, would definitely see the, the um, offshore oil and gas assets imp uh, quality improve. So the next we have the Capital uh, Capital Land Commercial Trust uh, earnings. I'll pass it over to Tong. Hi, good morning, clients. This is Tong Hong here. We had um, we had a few reads reported last week. And um, we had two from the Capital Land family, uh, one from the office space, one from the retail space. I'll go through each one of them now. We start off with Capital Land Commercial Trust, uh, reported on Friday. As my title says, first rebound in office rents in nine quarters. So I think if there's one key takeaway you need to have from the results, that will be it. Um, let me go through line by line for the results first. For revenue, it's pretty flat. They had some divestments this year, one George Street, Wiki Edge, Golden Shoe Car Park. But all these were offset by stronger performance from Capital Green. Uh, as we all know, they took over 100% of Capital Green since last year. And then um, flowing down to MPI, MPI was up 2.7% uh, despite the flat revenue. That is because property taxes were lower because of all the divestments that they had. And distributable income actually went up uh, 7%. And this is due to first the uh, higher income from Capital Green. That's one. And number two, they also did a cash top up using the proceeds that they gotten from 
all the divestments this year. So as we have noted in our earlier reports as well, there is this commitment by the management to utilize the proceeds to stabilize DPU if and when necessary uh, because uh, they divested three properties and so you can expect a bit of shortfall in rental going forward but it's, it's good to note that the divestments were at valuations way above um, what was carried on the book as high as 30 over percent 20 over percent for one George Street for WKH so there is enough buffer in those divestment proceeds to sustain the shortfall in rental and um, as for portfolio wise portfolio renewals we believe they're still experiencing negative reversions and this trend is likely to continue sorry this trend is likely to continue into 2018 because that will be the year the 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 manager will be renewing leases for those that are signed in uh, 2015 because typically we see office contracts they are at three year contracts for the typical contracts and you renew for a contract signed in 2015 that was the peak of the office index rental index from that from that time until now we have dropped 20 percent so there will be likely pressure in 2018 as well but the mitigating factor is that we see the first recovery in office rents after nine quarters this quarter we saw a 1.7 percent up and so this recovery sustain uh, if it sustains going forward from now until 2018 that should buffer some of the um, negative spread that you see between current uh, current rates and the uh, rates that they are going to recontract so all in all we maintain accumulate for this read target price unchanged at 180 so that I think the key takeaway from this is that you see that across sectors office retail industrial this is the sector that is I would say recovering the fastest where we if you look at the other rentals for the other sectors they're still pretty much downward sloping and at least we are seeing some form of recovery for office rents already we move on to retail sector next not not as rosy a picture for CMT revenue is pretty flat as well they had some malls where they had lower, lower rentals like Bodok Mall like Plaza Singh uh, MPI was up slightly 1.6 percent that is due to lower property taxes and utilities expenses so the improvement in MPI margins sustained this um, this um, uh, MPI margins despite the flat revenue uh, but as for as for the portfolio there is um, tenant sales is still flat this is still this is a continuation of a trend we have seen this year from first Q we had a slight negative one over percent down in tenant sales first half we had flat tenant sales now nine months we are still doing, looking at flat and we contrast this with if you look at the overall stats tracked by sing stats that that statistic will actually show you that retail sales is recovering this year since March slightly you have an average growth rate of about three to four percent this year excluding motor vehicles and so the difference in these two metrics could be due to one sing stats track the both online and offline sales and then you have other metrics which are non brick and mortar non shopping mall kind of sales like your patrol services patrol patrol station sales that segment actually went up quite a bit this year as well so I think the difference then can be boiled down to the fact that probably some of this growth would be led by online sales and um, some of these sales that are not happening in the brick and mortar malls for 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 the manager for their portfolio some of the malls continue to be still under pressure in terms of rental reversion especially in the east um, you see Bedok Mall, Tampanese Mall and we feel that the, um, some of this uh, some of this supply in the east such as your Paya Square your Jewel they are going to make up close to a 1.1 million square feet in new retail space over these two years uh, so that's going to add a bit of pressure to malls in the east so 
all in all, we have a neutral, maintain a neutral on CMT. Target price is unchanged at 201. And uh, I guess the key takeaway from this for the outlook is that we still expect the operating performance to be very challenging with the with all the threat of e-commerce and especially this year we seeing the entrance of Amazon. So uh, challenges still remain and we still expect the, 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 the this sector to remain a tough one to 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 um, navigate in. Morning everyone, uh, Richard speaking. So now I'll touch on the results for Capital DC REIT. Uh, we are maintaining our neutral on Capital DC REIT, uh, target price 136, uh, forecasted DPU of 7.36 cents. That will give you a 5.4% yield uh, based on last Friday's close. Uh, we'll quickly look, go through the numbers. Uh, Gross revenue was uh, higher year on year, 57%. Uh, that was driven all by acquisitions. Um, so there's the Milan data center, Cardiff data center, uh, B10 data center, which was acquired in September this year, in this quarter, and the 90% interest in Capital DC Singapore 3. Uh, there's some uh, offset from lower basis Bay DC. That's the one in... Um, Malaysia where the master lease had expired and the tenant only renewed two out of three stories in that data center. Um, this here shows um, the historical DPU for last year, 1.9 cents. So this year, 1.74 cents uh, is the uh, effect of the professional offering, uh, the 274 for 1,000 that was used to acquire Capital DC Singapore 3. So after adjusting out uh, the preferential offering and one-off uh, net property tax refund, uh, you're looking at a 4.2% year-on-year increase in DPU. Uh, this is if you had uh, subscribed to the preferential offer. So on a portfolio performance-wise, uh, the whale remains long, uh, although it shortened a uh, little bit quarter on quarter. Uh, that's the natural aging of the whale. Uh, however, whale, we expect the whale to further be extended again when uh, two of their major tenants in the Singapore properties renew their lease by the end of this year. Uh, aggregate leverage also remains low, 32.1%. Uh, it rose from 27.7% because of the debt that was drawn down to acquire the B10 data center in mid of September. The negative thing about the portfolio now is uh, one of the biggest negative is Capital DC Dublin one is still underutilized at uh, 58%. Um, it's currently going it will undergo an AEI that will start at the end of this year. That's to uh, upgrade the power supply. And after that AEI is done, uh, it should be more attractive uh, to prospective tenants. We also uh, think that an equity fundraising is around the corner. Um, the current gearing is 32.1%, uh, although it's very low, uh, but it's uh, very close to the historical high that uh, the manager has allowed the gearing to go to. Uh, that was 32.5% after the acquisition of the Milan Data Center. So after the acquisition of Milan Data Center, um, the manager acquired Capital DC Singapore 3, and during that acquisition, uh, they had a pressure offering in conjunction with that. Um, that acquisition. So the uh, REIT's gearing has not exceeded 32.5% and the, the manager has not allowed it to creep up uh, to 40% even though manager has repeatedly said that it's comfortable with 40. Uh, the other thing is for in terms of price, uh, current price is already 1.4 times book. Uh, this would make a uh, good sense to raise new equity when the price is at this level. 
Okay, we'll move on to Jeremy Ng. Good morning, everyone. Jeremy speaking here. So for my part, uh, I'll just briefly go through uh, the updates for the Philippe Monthly Recession Tracker. So last month, we actually did a report uh, to sort of uh, spot uh, nine relative uh, indicators, uh, both on fundamental as well as technical, to sort of uh, identify and spot major market turning points in the U.S. equity market. And as of last month, in terms of how things have changed, uh, pretty much everything seems to be intact. And hence, uh, the title over here all remains well. And what I mean by that is, so on this particular slide over here, you can see uh, the indicators that we are watching. So in total, there are nine that we are currently watching to sort of a spot for major turning points within the U.S. equity market. But as of last month, pretty much none of the indicators that we are watching are uh, flashing rate yet. And hence, uh, the conclusion from this particular slide is uh, we believe that the broad-based equity market uh, from here on, we still have some more strength to actually grind higher. Uh, I mean, mainly we are talking about uh, the big cap uh, indexes out there, such as the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, as well as the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And what we actually saw was uh, some observation was that uh, how this particular uptrend since the start of this year was sort of being uh, propped up by the 20 and 60 day moving average, which I will go more in depth in the following slide. And just to give you a slight understanding of uh, what happened last month in September for these indicators. So in terms of the interest rate complex wise, TED spread and 210 spread pretty much uh, stay uh, flat for the whole of September. So nothing much to see here in terms of what the interest rates are doing. Uh, as well as uh, the sentiment indicators within the consumer side of things. So the three indicators that we watch for sentiment are the conference board consumer confidence, University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment as well as the Bloomberg Consumer Comfort. Uh, all these three indicators still continue to uh, remain elevated at the euphoria high point. But one thing to highlight over here is uh, UMICH Consumer Sentiment actually uh, sort of uh, outperform again and uh, for the month of September broke a new high to a high of 101.1. .1. Uh, this is actually a high that we haven't seen uh, since 2004, which then again uh, further justifies for the euphoria that is sort of uh, being felt by the market right now. Uh, in terms of employment side of things, unemployment rate continued to improve for the month of September uh, from 4.4% to a low of 4.2%. So pretty much uh, everything still remains pretty nice uh, in terms of what the fundamentals are showing. Uh, in terms of Fed funds rate, uh, what we sort of uh, look out for in terms of any warning sign from the Fed is uh, we observe that if the Fed actually goes ahead uh, and halt their rate hike cycle or the tightening phase, uh, there might be a point of uh, reference whereby the Fed is signaling that there might be some form of weakness. Uh, in the month of September, even though there wasn't any rate hike, uh, rates was left at 1.25%, uh, but we saw how the Fed actually announced that they are going to taper or actually reduce their balance sheet uh, by $10 billion, uh, per month starting from October, uh, which means they are still on the path of a tightening phase, and hence, uh, in this particular Fed funds rate kind of uh, indicator we are currently watching, uh, it's still sort of a signaling that all is still well from this perspective as the Fed is still on a tightening phase uh, rather than a dovish kind of uh, rhetoric. Uh, as well as the market-based indicator S&P 500 and the value line geometric, which basically is the uh, equal weighted market cap of uh, 1,700 stocks. Uh, these two particular index still continue to edge up higher, uh, sort of uh, showing the bullish sentiment that is also being reflected uh, nicely within the market. So all in all, uh, pretty much... Uh, None of the indicators are flashing red yet and all still signals that further upside might be expected from the uh, Broadway's equity market. And so just to look in terms of uh, what the price action is showing from the S&P 500 uh, chart. So this is a daily chart of the S&P 500 index. And just to give you a very brief uh, overview of what happened since uh, the election day of uh, US where Donald Trump actually won presidency. You can see before that S&P 500 was more or less pretty much uh, stuck in the range. And only after the day whereby 8 of November came, whereby uh, President Trump actually won the election, you can see uh, this crazily big bar actually popped up appear, and then uh, after which uh, this uptrend actually emerged and moved on pretty uh, violently. So what I want to point out over here uh, is to emphasize on the red line and the blue line. So red line shows the 20-day exponential moving average, while the blue line shows the 60-day exponential moving average. 
So you can see over here, uh, the highlight for this particular chart is uh, this uptrend has been sort of a nicely being propelled higher on every correction uh, once it tests the 20 or 60 day exponential moving average. And it has worked uh, time and time again since the start of this year uh, for every correction. So for instance, uh, after 8th of November, you can see there was some correction over this period of time. 20-day uh, moving average acting as the first line of defense will usually pop the uptrend um, back up. And you can see subsequently there was another correction over here whereby the 20-day came in and saved the particular uptrend again. So ultimately, uh, once we get some further correction that is uh, sort of a deeper, uh, if the first line of defense of the 20-day moving average sort of fails, uh, the second line of defense will come into play, which for this particular chart is the 60-day exponential moving average shown by this blue line. So you can see subsequently the blue line started to react perfectly to pop uh, the S&P 500 index higher on every single correction uh, all the way until this particular point here back in August uh, period. So you can see the buy the dip kind of strategy has been pretty much enforced within the market right now uh, and we believe that uh, like the, what the recession indicators are, indicators are showing, none of them are actually flashing red yet. So moving forward, what we expect the broad-based equity market to do is to continue to grind higher in such a particular price action pattern whereby every correction will be sort of being supported by the red or the blue line of the 20 and 60 day moving average and every single correction will be uh, sort of a force and propped up higher for the index to form a new record high. And just another thing to note over here is uh, the bottom panel shows the RSI which is the relative strength index which measure, measures uh, momentum. Uh, anything above 70 shows o overbought and I highlighted three points over here during this period over here in December, you can see the RSI hit a high of 77. Uh, usually once we hit a high above 75, uh, it tells us that an imminent short-term correction might be happening. And hence during this period, you can see this correction happen once the RSI exceeded 70. Same thing over here in around um, Feb to March period, hit a high of 82. And you can see subsequently, uh, the S&P 500 actually entered into a deeper correction, whereby, like I mentioned again, the 60-day moving average actually popped the uptrend uh, back up. So right now, uh, as of last Friday, we actually hit a new record high in the S&P 500, which then led to the RSI actually hitting a new high again at 82 instead. So moving forward, what we think uh, in the near term, price section wise, I think S&P 500 will actually uh, hit into some short term correction uh, in the near term. But ultimately, again, like I mentioned, the 20 and 60 day moving area should more or less keep the uptrend intact, whereby the short term correction is being halted and reverse back higher. And this price action pattern is not only just uh, apparent in the S&P 500, uh, it's also very obvious in the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, in this particular slide. So same thing over here, uh, red line shows the 20-day moving average and blue, blue line shows the 60-day moving average. And you can see the highlighted areas over there mark the point whereby the correction was being halted by either the 20 or 60-day moving average pretty nicely. And same thing over here, the RSI is also showing overbought currently at 86. And we believe for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the near-term kind of a price action is uh, the same as the S&P 500, whereby we might see some near-term correction next, uh, followed by a strong rebound of the 20 and 60 day moving average. And last but not least, again, uh, NASDAQ 100, showing the same kind of a price action pattern, whereby uh, the 20 and 60 day moving average actually uh, holds the uptrend intact. And hence, in summary, uh, what we see is uh, since None of the U.S. recession indicators are flashing red yet. Uh, we believe the market, U.S. equity market, should continue to grind higher from here on uh, until some of the indicators are actually being breached to the downside. And hence, buying the deep kind of a strategy should work pretty nicely with uh, the three major indices over there. Uh, somewhere around the 20 and 60 day moving average should provide a good benchmark to uh, enter back into the uptrend for the U.S. equity market. And for those who have not actually uh, saw our in-depth report whereby we explain how we uh, observe and identify uh, the indicators to spot market tops. Uh, please refer to the links over here for the report as well as the uh, webinar we play for it. And with that, I'll, I'll pass on the rest of the time to Paul to talk about the site visit for UG Healthcare. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Um, just to move on to our site, our site visit on UG Healthcare. Uh, UG Healthcare is um, it's a glove manufacturer from Malaysia. I think it was listed uh, late 2014, so only about two, two, year, two three years. 
Um, just to highlight, when we were at the plant, I think the focus has been on their plant expansion. Uh, the their present capacity is uh, 2.54 billion, as you can see from the table below. Um, and they plans to to move it, move it to 2.9 uh, by end of uh, next year, and eventually to uh, 3.2 billion. Uh, uh, well, not not in this chart. The, uh, essentially, uh, due to their sm smaller capacity or smaller size, as you can see, uh, s s the peers can be some of their peers like like top glove is 50 billion capacity. This is only 2.4. So uh, with this small size, they have to focus on uh, building up their own brands and also the distribution network. Uh, the focus has been uh, distribution network in, in particular Europe, which is uh, UK and Germany. Uh, they focus a lot on the dental markets. Uh, they are one of the, and if you look at the table above, uh, which is the, the valuations, uh, you notice that they are obviously the, the, the cheapest, about 11 times forward. Uh, but also, but this is due to their weaker margins and also the uh, the lower ROEs. Uh, and when I move on back to the uh, in, to the industry. Uh, if you look at the report, uh, while it's not here, the industry has been growing uh, seven percent CAGR. Uh, the industry is now moving at about twenty billion, uh, seventeen to twenty billion of gloves per per year of of the of incremental demand. Uh, where the growth will come will be China and and Brazil. Uh, just to give you some, a, a bit of flavor, uh, the consumption of gloves in China and Brazil is only 4 to 31 per capita. Uh, and, and, it's, uh, and whereas in China, uh, whereas in US, it's 200. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, and the emerging markets will be where the, the growth driver will come. Uh, the final point of vinyl glove, what has happened, the current situation is that uh, vinyl glove is about 160 billion. Uh, it's all, as large as the rubber glove market. Uh, what has happened is that due to environmental reasons, uh, the government has actually clamped down on the uh, vinyl glove. So there's a vinyl glove shortage. And what we are seeing is that uh, the, the, the demand in China uh, is switching away from vinyl gloves due to the higher price and shortage, and they're moving into uh, rubber. Uh, that's it. Uh, more details is in the report. Uh, you can just some pictures of what they do and the, and the plant that we visited. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I move on to Ter Hong. Uh, he will uh, be on the first read uh, side visit. Okay, we uh, for first read we went to visit four of their hospitals in in Jakarta late last month. And I guess for First Street, even though they are the landlord, uh, a lot of um, the uh, the REITs' uh, uh, basis or the, the, the selling point is because of the sponsors' aggressive expansion in the healthcare sector in Indonesia. So the vehicle they're using is Siloam Hospitals. So the four hospitals we visited were all operated by Siloam. And um, I guess the sustainability of the business model of Siloam actually matters a lot for First Street as well, in that it enables the sponsor to 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 carry on the expansion phase and to carry on the capital recycling into First Street. So for the four hospitals we saw in Jakarta under First Street, we were of the opinion that most of the um, equipment, uh, a lot of the equipment in these hospitals, they are actually pretty modern. And uh, since the founding of this hospital, they've actually been a pioneer in rolling out some of the latest technologies in healthcare in Indonesia. For example, you have the CT scan, the 256 slice, as well as the um, gamma knife technology. That is actually a radiation um, method of treating brain tumors. Of uh, That means the non-invasive, uh, non-invasive, non-surgery kind of um, treatment method for brain tumors in that uh, radiation, radiotherapy is used to, um, to, to, to kill off the cancer cells instead of going through the surgery. So for this, we see that uh, for Siloam Lipo Village, they are the only hospital in Indonesia with this kind of facility. And um, this kind of facility, you see that in Singapore as well. For instance, you see that in Parkway, 
hospitals locally as well. And for Siloam, uh, we see that uh, the national healthcare insurance that is one of the main drivers of uh, healthcare demand. We mentioned that in our initiation report as well. That actually contributed to a bit of the jump in uh, the healthcare demand in Indonesia. For FY16 for Siloam, we see that revenue from this national healthcare insurance actually grew from 5 to 7 percent the year before to 20 percent of total revenue in FY16. So in 2019 is the target that the government wishes to achieve nationwide coverage. And um, we realized that the um, insurance premiums were actually pretty affordable as well. The details are in our report. And another big driver for the, the potential demand from the healthcare is the low penetration rate of private health insurance in Indonesia. We see that it's only at 8%. You compare to neighboring peers, is maybe about 15 to 20% in Malaysia and Thailand. So this segment, there is a bit of um, potential in, in, in driving the future demand for healthcare as well as affluence get better amongst the citizens and then this penetration rate increases. You can see potentially the, the demand for private healthcare can increase as well. And um, uh, regarding the uh, issue of the shortage of doctors in Indonesia, that is a pretty well-known fact because they have uh, only 0 0.3 doctors per 1,000 population. That is the stats from 2012. You compare that 0 0.3 to neighboring countries is, is very low. You compare that to Thailand, 0 0.7. Malaysia is 1.3. And in Indonesia, they have this rule whereby only local doctors are allowed to practice. And uh, one of the ways they try to mitigate this shortfall in doctors is that the LIPO group, which is the first reads parent, they have their own uh, chain of schools, right, from primary education all the way to universities. They have their own university, with their own medical faculty as well, where they will train doctors. And these doctors will then subsequently be sent out to Siloam hospitals upon graduation. Uh, all in all, we maintain a neutral on first read. Target price is still unchanged at 132. And um, these are, these, from these two pictures, you can see these are the registration counters for two of the hospitals we visited. Generally, most of them very busy at the registration counters. Uh, Siloam hospitals as well, the overall occupancy year on year has been up in FY16 as well. These are the these are the wards. Uh, they look very, very clean, very modern. In fact, I don't think they are very far cry from what we see in Singapore. Uh, you see this in this is the class three ward in MR Triple C, and that is Indonesia's only private cancer hospital. And this fully air conditioned ward qualifies for the nation nationwide insurance as well. This is the this is the VIP ward. I think these wards. You, you find that they are they are not they won't pale in comparison if you compare them with what you see in private hospitals here as well and then this is um we talked we talked about some of the modern equipments that they have this is the linear accelerator for cancer radiotherapy and this one actually can shorten treatment time to five minutes versus the usual 10 over minutes that you get for other normal machines this machine you only have two available in all private hospitals in Indonesia. And this is the Gamma Knife facility that was previously mentioned as well. And then the helipads. Some of the hospitals are equipped with helipads. We know we know the notorious state of the traffic jams in the country. So and and um, they have this um, nationwide emergency ambulance call number as well, which at at the country level, currently, they do not have a universal uh, emergency call number across the country as yet. Okay, so with that, we have come to the end of our presentation. So feel free to ask us any questions that you have.
Hi, this is uh, Richard speaking. Uh, there's a question on when the Kepler DC Dublin AEI will be complete. Uh, that one, uh, the manager has not given any timeline for how long the AEI will take. Hi, there's a question on um, CCT in that because of the recent divestments, would that impact dividend going forward? So I think we have gotten a commitment from the management as well and this is demonstrated this quarter as well in that uh, some of the divestment proceeds can potentially be used to offset the uh, shortfall in rental revenue. So by our estimates, for this quarter, the shortfall in rental revenue from the three properties that they've divested should be about f sorry, should be about fifteen million in a quarter. So if you add if you look at fifteen million versus what they earn 75, 75 million, so originally it would have been ninety million. So fifteen out of ninety is close to maybe like a close to twenty percent. Uh the thing is, for this quarter, it was able to be made up by the stronger performance from Capital Green, but uh, any other shortfall was topped up with a 3.3 .3 million top up this quarter. And going forward, the we are pretty confident that management will also utilize the proceeds to top up capital, uh, top up DPU should there be a shortfall. And the thing to note is that because the divestments were done at very good valuations above what they were carried on the books we had we had um the transacted prices at 20 plus percent 30 plus percent above the last valuation price so i think this uh, excess um the, the investment gains would be enough to buffer the shortfall for from the from the divestments and important to note is that um the divestments were also at better cap rates in terms of um, if you talk about capital recycling, the divestments were at cap rates of maybe like 3.2 to 3.4 percent, and the capital was recycled into better yielding assets such as the one we saw the announcement this year in Asia Square. So all in all, I think it's um uh, if it's a worry about uh, shortfall in dividend going forward from divestments, I think the top up from the divestment process should be more than enough.
Hi, there's another question on the comparison between Capital Land and CDL. We our house view on both is are both accumulates, but the investment theses are kind of different. Uh, for exposure to exposure to local the local property scene, we see that CDL is much bigger, especially in the residential space. And you can see from uh, this year the on block site they won as well is uh is is a it was a bullish bid, and not just the new land sites they gotten even existing inventory as well new futura is not launched yet they're going to launch it at the end of this year and they still have existing inventory in gramercy park as well so exposure to singapore residential definitely cdl is the clear choice over capital land capital land has been has been pretty quiet on that front but for capital land the investment thesis from us is the um is the is the is the build up of the retail uh, presence in China? Their malls are all very well located at the at the major transport hubs, and uh, we saw a few Raffles cities being built over the last few years. This two years is where we are past the gestation period, and these Raffles city shopping malls are coming online fully operational and this is the time where this this malls will start contributing to uh, the earnings and that is our main investment thesis for capital land so you're looking at two different investment theses here Okay, hi, this is Paul here. Uh, there's a question on UG. Uh, what is the competitive advantage of UG against uh, Hatta Lega Top Glove? Uh, it's it's going to be hard for for UG to to compete head on with with these uh, giants, as you can see from the from the chart. Uh, I think U UG's capacity is probably less than one month of their cap of their uh, production. Or their their capacity. That, that is why for for UG, uh, they have to you have to go for the niche products and build your own distribution network. Uh, and there is the and you target the markets that are very fragmented. Uh, for healthcare, you you target the labs where demand is is smaller and more fragmented. Uh, and and that's what is their strategy. Uh, if you do, if you go head on with with this. Uh, big boys, uh, especially on some of the large tenders by some of the hospitals, like 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 in, in UK, uh, you will get you cannot compete against the the, the volume and and skill that they have. Yeah, thanks. Hi, uh, there's a question asking, uh, there's a possibility of US index actually going to retracement to the 20 or 60 EMA. Uh, is it not a good time to sort of uh, buy Singapore stocks uh, or REITs? Uh, so, like I mentioned just now in the previous slide of what the US is currently showing, uh, as of now, again, none of the indicators are flashing red yet. And all in all, I think in the long run, or maybe for another six, three to six more months, the trend, long-term trend-wise, I think no matter how, it's still going to be a buy the deep kind of strategy whereby the market is going to edge higher to break new record high after new record high. 
uh, what we have seen for the past uh, two to three months. So in terms of correction wise, we won't know for sure when this correction might come. Uh, and even if a correction might come like I show here in this particular chart, uh, the correction might be pretty uh, minute, probably in a correction of range of 2 to 5 percent. And probably once that happens again, uh, once price we test the 20 and 60 exponential moving average, uh, we should more or less see the same kind of a price action playing out, but it will rebound back higher. So in terms of like Singapore stocks and uh, REITs, uh, probably from that perspective, uh, it might follow uh, in a sort of a similar fashion. Uh, but again, the long-term trend as of now, what the U.S. is currently showing is that uh, in the long run, I think the U.S. equity market should continue to edge up higher and break new highs uh, with the 20 and 60 acting as a, a sort, of, sort of a support to propel price higher. So in terms of timing wise, we won't know for sure, but obviously if the next correction were to come, a uh, good timing kind of uh, methodology is to look out to enter the market on the dips uh, once we see a retest of the 20 or 60, which is being shown by the red or blue line over here. Hi. Hi guys, uh, there's a question on um, property developers. So the question is that, is there a risk in that the um, high land prices that we are seeing now will translate into uh, high-end products which then uh, developers may have difficulty selling in the market. So is the market being too bullish on developers right now? So I think we go on a, we go on a valuation basis first. Um, if we look at valuations of say CDL which we have an accumulate call on the price to book now book by the way is held at historical cost um, the price to book is like um, 1.15 right now the average post GFC is 1.22 okay so we are trading at close to the post GFC average valuation we are entering an up cycle in the property market so I think based on the valuation front, it is not it doesn't look too expensive given that we are entering an up market in the property sector. Uh, that is from the valuation front, and it's true that the um, prices that some of these developers are projecting, the increases that they are forecasting is 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 it can be as high as upwards of thirty percent. You see that some of the um, some of the break even costs. Some of the 
break even cost alone for developer sites are what surrounding transactions are doing for so break even is already current selling price then if you throw in a 10 plus percent margins for developers that is how much they are thinking that they can they can the market is going up by if you look at uh, CDL's last uh, CDL site in Amber Road if you look at uh, Chip Heng Singh's um, um, tender in the Changi Gardens the land price for Changi Gardens was 888 the vicinity is selling for 800 plus and 800 plus is the is for similar freehold condos just adjacent to it so you can see the bullishness in that but the thing is that firstly I think first to market is important because in that you a lot of these on block sites developers are targeting areas where there is a, a, a lack in supply for a long time we know that generally in the market supply is at the lowest for more than in more than 10 years lower supply and in inventory since 2006 and a lot of these targeted locations like for instance the, the Wing Thai land in Serangoon North where there's a cluster of private housing um, shortage of supply in that area for a long time Changi as well in Changi Gardens area so shortage of supply for such a long time I think there'll be a bit of pent-up demand so first to market is important especially if you look at areas which are very crowded such as the 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 Serangoon Haokang area a lot of land bids have occurred in that area so I think if you are first to one of the first to markets maybe the demand will still be able to absorb going by especially there will still be pent-up demand from the on block displaced households as well and then secondly I think um, the market may be seeing some form of improving affordability in the houses I mean if you look at prices prices are going up and I'm talking about improving affordability it may sound like a bit contrary but improving affordability is a function of the land the housing unit size and the land prices and the, the selling prices so selling prices may be going up but we see that the average size of condos being sold in the market they're getting smaller and smaller in 2007 you see that the average size of condo sold is uh, 170 square meters right and in 2016 we see that the average size of all the condo sold in that year is just 100 square meters so if your your sizes are getting smaller so the quantum PSF can be a bit higher but as long as the sweet spot range is still within 1 million 1.34 million I think that is still within the affordability range of quite a bit of people especially now I think we have a lot of um, equity from the huge rise in HDB prices over the years so we see that the total total um, mortgage to total housing assets in Singaporean household balance sheets they have dropped from say 32 percent 10 years ago to 27% right now so if these households were to lever up I think there's still a bit of ammunition they can fire into the market so generally I think uh, it's, it's still is still is a is a tough call to say which projects will have difficulty selling out but I think first to market is important and a lot of these developers are playing on increasing affordability by building smaller units but going from the valuation point of view I think we are not looking at very expensive um, developers if you're looking at um, if you're asking if the market is too bullish on developers because let's say for CDL they have not just um, the tailwinds from residential units in Singapore they have they have the holding in MNC as well MNC as we mentioned before it was trading at such a big discount to book 45% discount to book and if you look at the peers in the locally listed peers Shangri-La Asia your Mandarin Oriental your Banyan tree average they were trading at 0.9 plus times book so um, that 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 MNC stick can be a potential tailwind for CDL as well
I think that's all the questions we have for this morning. So with that, we will come. We will come to the end of our presentation, and we will. We look forward to seeing you guys again next week.